Hi, I am Patricia Moulton, Executive Director of the North Dakota Center for Nursing, and I would like to introduce you to our Empowering Nurses to Lead, Every Nurse in Every Setting Online Leadership Program. This program was developed by the North Dakota Action Coalition as a part of the Future of Nursing Campaign for Action. Hi, I'm Cheryl Kalber from the University of Mary, and I would like to share with you a little background on the North Dakota Action Coalition. The Action Coalition is a member of the National Campaign for Action that was actually established in response to the Institute of Medicine Future of Nursing recommendations. It is in conjunction with the AARP and Robert Woods Johnson Foundation. The action areas that resulted from the research of this particular Institute of Medicine report include leadership, nursing practice and care, the education of nurses, interprofessional collaboration, and diversity. Here in North Dakota, our Action Coalition has focused on the leadership development of our nursing workforce. As Cheryl indicated, the North Dakota Action Coalition is focused on the leadership development area of focus for the national campaign. Over the last two years, we have been working in groups to develop leadership training that has been customized to the needs of North Dakota nurses. For more information about our Action Coalition, please visit the website listed on the slide. These leadership modules have been developed to be suitable for every nurse in every setting. The Action Coalition groups that develop these modules found that there are several key leadership skills that are shared by nurse leaders across every workplace setting. Increasing leadership in our nurses is important because nationally it has been shown that when nurses are positioned to influence system practices and policies, that this leads to improvements in the quality of care, wellness, and a reduction in medical errors. Nurses just like you have led innovative initiatives that have reduced falls with harm, reduced code blue calls, reduced 30-day readmissions, and improved care transitions. The North Dakota Center for Nursing and the Action Coalition encourages you to utilize your leadership skills as every nurse is a leader. Ways to share your expertise as a leader include volunteering with both healthcare and non-healthcare related committees and organizations. This can also include serving on boards. Speaking up in the workplace is also an important way to use your leadership skills and is a key factor in reducing errors. Speaking up is also important in the policy arena. We encourage you to pursue lifelong learning and to help mentor others as they start to develop their leadership abilities. Sharing the Institute of Medicine report is also a great way to start a conversation. You can also join the North Dakota Center for Nursing Leadership Team or the North Dakota Action Coalition. The North Dakota Action Coalition is co-led by the North Dakota Center for Nursing and the University of Mary Harold Schaefer Emerging Leaders Academy. The North Dakota Center for Nursing was established in 2011 and is a 501c3 nonprofit organization to create a unified voice for nursing excellence. Our mission is to guide the ongoing development of a well-prepared and diverse nursing workforce to meet the needs of citizens of North Dakota through research, education, recruitment and retention, advocacy, and public policy. The University of Mary Harold Schaefer Emerging Leaders Academy is an experiential learning program for honors students who learn leadership skills in the context of their future career. In the School of Health Sciences, we work with all of the allied health sciences along with the pre-professional programs to help them to become servant leaders of moral courage. We have an advisory board of external representatives that help us with the outcomes of this program. There is an old adage which asks, are leaders born or are they made? Well, in reality, all leaders are born as we know that we all enter the world in that way. But what's more important to realize is that leadership can be learned. It can be developed. It is everybody's business and it is not inherent to a title. It is based on relationships, not a right given to you by a board or your executive manager. It is learned and is not a job. And you can always develop in leadership by adding more skills in an ongoing process. In nursing, we for years we have spoken of nurse managers and it's time we look at a new paradigm. We need to move into leadership. 
nurses need to be at the table when important decisions are made at local, regional, or even national levels, decisions that affect the patients that they so closely advocate for. Managers are those people that keep things moving, and we need them. They focus on systems and on processes, and they make sure that things run smoothly. But I would like to challenge you to become a nurse leader, someone who has a vision, who innovates, who thinks about the future, and who challenges the status quo to bring ever better care to our patient population. This online leadership program is divided into four modules that were developed for every nurse and in every setting. Each module includes slides with content, further resources, and additional information, along with a link to an evaluation survey for contact hours. Each module also includes a set of additional optional activities that are designed to help you apply what you have learned and to increase your leadership skills. Materials from these activities can be submitted for a completion certificate. Completion of all four modules will place you in a special leadership pool. The four modules include communication that is a foundational for learning and understanding about systems, knowledge of how systems function is necessary to institute change, and the ability to accept and engage in change is necessary to be an advocate for health policy. Hello, my name is Karma Hansen, and I currently serve as a nurse at All True Health System and the coordinator for Safe Kids Grand Forks. I've spent much of my life engaged in public policy and love the health policy arena. I'm excited to be able to bring you today to the health policy module, Making a Difference in Your Profession Through Advocacy. This module is brought to you by the North Dakota Center for Nursing. The objectives for this module include those that you see listed on the slide. The North Dakota Action Coalition is focused on the leadership development areas of focus from the national campaign. There have been four working groups over a two-year period of time that have developed the leadership training customized to the needs of North Dakota nurses. These areas and modules include leadership development, communication, change and innovation, and health policy and advocacy, and that is the module that is featured here. For more information on these modules, you can contact the North Dakota Center for Nursing at the website listed below. To successfully complete the learning activity and be awarded contact hours, the learner must complete the slides found in the training module, complete the course evaluation, and to earn a certificate of achievement in leadership development, you'll need to complete the additional project as described at the end of this learning module. More information will be provided after you are done. This module has been created thanks to the help and input from the following people. The content creators include John Mitzel, who is a banking and financial economics major at the University of North Dakota, and by myself, Karma Hansen, again, the coordinator of Safe Kids Grand Forks and a nurse at All True Health System. The Health Policy Committee had several active and engaged members as a part of our committee. We are grateful for the hard work that they have put in to make this module be full of lots of information that we hope will be very helpful. Those health policy committee members are as listed on this slide. As you can see from the previous list of team members involved in the content and development of this module, this has been a large and active group of team members. Much discussion has taken place about what to include in this module. The group was in consensus that this topic, health policy and advocacy, is an important one for nurses to have a good understanding of, but one that they often have very little training in. The lack of understanding and experience leads to fear, and a fear that can keep knowledgeable, skilled, and capable nurses from entering the policy and advocacy arena. Our hope is that you will find this module informational and comprehensive as a means to educate participants on this extensive topic. Come join us in the health policy arena. This is Wanda Rose. I am a associate professor of nursing practice here at NDSU at Sanford Bismarck. Today uh, we will be looking at nurses and their role in policy development and advocacy. Whether you are a bedside nurse in advanced practice, 
practitioner, a nurse executive, or one of the many other roles that nurses take on, you are most likely impacted by health care policy decisions at one level or another, from issuing advanced practice licenses to insurance coverage issues for your particular patient type to cost and reimbursement issues. Nurses are impacted by decisions that are made in the political arena, whether they are cognizant of it or not. Many nurses entered the profession because they had a caring heart and compassion was one of their strong qualities. While those are worthy and wonderful qualities to possess as a nurse, our hope with this module is that you will also see that being an astute health policy advocate is important to the profession as well. To many nurses, policy practice is not an arena where they may have a great deal of experience. There might have been an upper-level nursing class that focused on health policy or the legislative process, but for most programs, the focus was on care plans, nursing interventions, bedside care, and the disease process. Therefore, many nurses may not feel equipped to enter the policy arena, speak up for nursing issues, or get involved in local, state, or national decisions that can and do impact nursing and health care. This module will take you through the political process from very basic explanations of the legislative process to how a bill becomes a law to how nurses can get involved as both a professional and an individual. Influencing factors shaping health policy in our state and country. As we begin this module, we will explore several factors that are influencing health policy and why nursing should be involved in this arena. There are many factors that influence health policy, whether in city ordinance, on a statewide or national level, or simply within an organization. Here are a few of these factors. Values. These are often defined in nursing social policy statement, a code of ethics, or the standards of practice and performance. Interest groups. These may be nursing in nature or other ones such as gay rights, women's issues, rural health, or etc. Media. The media now plays a huge role in influencing policy, whether we want to acknowledge that or not. Media is often focused on news, but oftentimes on, an inter on entertainment as well. Science and research. Nurses are key in formulating questions and searching the literature for research that pertains to issues. They are taught this skill as part of establishing evidence-based practice. Politics. Many politicians are in interested in promoting policy that will benefit their constituents or gain them political clout. Presidential power. The person in the White House, or in the case of state policy, the governor's mansion, often has an agenda they would like to see pushed through their tenure. This is often influenced by the political party that has dominance in the legislature and in elected office in the state. Advocacy and activism. Nursing advocacy is the function, foundation to nursing practice. We will discuss this more in a moment as we take a look at the six essential features of professional nursing. Policy analysis and analysis. As we continue to improve upon the policies that are in place and keep them current with the times, the process of analysis is important as that key role takes place, modification as that as that key role takes place, modifications to current policies or in the formulations of new ones is often the result. The American Nurses Association definition of nursing is as follows. Nursing is the protection, promotion, and optimization of health and abilities, prevention of illness and injury, alleviation of suffering through the diagnosis and treatment of human response, and advocacy in the care of individuals, families, communities, and populations. Okay, let's take a look at six essential features of professional nursing as defined by ANA. You will clearly begin to see where a knowledge of health policy and advocacy is a necessary component to practice as a professional nurse. One, Provision of a caring relationship that facilitates health and healing, probably the reason most of us went into nursing. Two, attention to the range of human experiences and responses to health 
and illness within the physical and social environments. Three, integration of objective data with knowledge gained from an appreciation of patient or group subjective experience. So. We continue with four, application of scientific knowledge to the process of diagnosis and treatment through the use of judgment and critical thinking. And five, advancement of professional nursing knowledge through scholarly inquiry. And six, influence and social and public policy to promote social justice. You can see from this definition that scholarly inquiry and influencing or advocating for social and public policy are two of the six components to serve out the role of a professional nurse. This module is designed to hone those skills so as to enhance your nursing practice. Policy is often created by hospital-wide committees as they set down guidelines for nursing practice, be that for a specific patient type, infection control practices, nursing pay issues, or a host of other important aspects of care and health delivery. Nursing can influence their professional issues core to our practice in a community setting as well. Think how influential a nurse could be serving on their church council or school board. When issues of health disparity or community needs are discussed, bringing a nurse with a voice to the table could be very instrumental in making changes that could affect large populations. While often not required for working in a clinical setting, being part of a professional organization or a or an association is another way in which a nurse can have a voice into topics that are critical to their delivery of care. Many of us have practice areas which are important to our practice, a place where our passion lies and where we want to make our mark on the care we provide. Being a part of like-type professionals allows our voice to be heard in unison and with a broader reach. The professional organizations are a great place for health policy to be carried out. There are many reasons why nurses should care about health policy and should engage and get involved. Some of these examples are listed here. Nurses are at the bedside and seeing many of the issues that are impacted by policy decisions firsthand. They see the effects of obesity on children, the impact of prenatal care on preterm infants, the devastating losses to families and society when people are involved in motor vehicle crashes and killed because of the lack of the use of seat belts. Nurses see the high cost of treating patients in the emergency room because their illness has gotten so bad due to lack of health insurance coverage or the effects of smoking on the lungs of their cardiac patient. These real life examples are powerful and impactful in bending the ear of legislators in affecting policy decision. Nursing is, is one of, if not the most trusted professions. Year after year, that trust in our work, our profession, and our practice should give us cause to raise our voice and be heard. Another reason nurses should or need to engage is that they are often caught between access to care, treatments and diagnostic services, and the cost of care. For example, we know that early screening and detection of certain cancers can be directly related to recovery from that disease, while providing extensive and long-term care for an advanced illness is very expensive. This is often necessary because the funding or priority was not placed on screening and early intervention that would have prevented that type of care. From early on in our nurses' education, we learned that eliminating health disparities is a role that nurses should play whether that be for the elderly population, children, certain cultures or ethnic groups, gender-specific disparities, or a wide array of, of other disparities that often exist, our role is to find mechanisms to eliminate them and provide care in non-judgmental or, or non-discriminatory fashion. As with many facets of our society, policymaking is often one way to eliminate those barriers and disparities. Having nurses carry that banner is part of the core role we should be undertaking and being adept at in navigating health policy arenas is one step to doing that effectively. Another reason nurses should be involved in policy issues is that it is one way to have a broader impact on change. 
We know much about change, and one elementary step is having the knowledge as to why change is necessary. But here is an example that will drive home why education alone may not be as effective. Let's take a look at the booster seat law in, in our state. In the past, North Dakota only required children up to the age of four to be in a booster seat. Once they hit that age, they could legally ride in a seat belt. While legal, they were clearly not safe. Emergency room doctors and trauma nurses were often first-hand observers in the injuries, deaths, and trauma associated with young children using a seat belt or nothing at all instead of a booster seat. There were many groups from, around, from and around our state that provided education to parents and caregivers. Those include hospital injury prevention programs, the Emergency Room Nurses Association, public health units, and many other safe, safety advocates. Booster seats began to rise as the education of importance was provided, but then it started to plateau. After a concerned group of individuals formed a network and coalition to support and promote an enhanced booster seat law, a new bill was passed that required children to be in a car or booster seat until age 8. This change in law created a new platform to discuss the safety rationale and it came with new enforcement efforts. This enforcement led people who may not have used the booster seats only to avoid a ticket, but now do so. The changing law led to new talking points and a raised awareness about the importance of booster seats. Death and injury rates declined in our state and cost to society fell as a result. The policy change had an impact on all citizens of the state, not just those areas previous touched by the educational efforts of an impassioned group of people. Nurses and other health care providers were at the forefront of this movement, and this is only but one example where their voice, energy, passion, and commitment is eliminating injury and death resulted in a powerful impact. Besides lending a voice to health care issues, nurses often share or provide the research and expertise to make changes that are proven and effective. Bringing data and research to conversations regarding health policy provides justification as to the direction that should be pursued. Nurses can provide that research and expertise that is valuable to changing policy and health care decisions. Besides our clinical and research expertise, nurses are equipped with leadership skills, the ability to create and adapt to change, and communication skills necessary to be effective in the profession and in the policy arena. In 2010, the Institute of Medicine released a report with recommendations entitled, The Future of Nursing, Leading Change, Advancing Health. The report listed several recommendations to be implemented by 2020 to advance the health of the nation. It listed four key messages that include, one, nurses should practice to the full extent of their education and training. Two, Nurses should achieve higher levels of education and training through an improved education system that promotes seamless academic progression. Three, nurses should be full partners with physicians and other healthcare professionals in redesigning healthcare in the United States. And four, effective workforce planning and policy making require better data collection and an improved information infra infrastructure. The report lists eight recommendations, and while we will not list off all of them here, the full report can be accessed at the link found in this site. We would like to pay particular attention to recommendation number seven. That is, prepare and enable nurses to lead change to advance health. Nurses, nursing education programs, and nursing associations should prepare the nursing workforce to assume leadership positions across all levels, while public, private, and governmental health care decision makers should ensure that leadership positions are available to and filled by nurses. In order to do that, it is suggested that nurses should take responsibility for their personal and professional growth by continuing their education and seeking opportunities to develop and exercise their leadership skills. Nursing associations should provide leadership and development 
mentoring programs, and opportunities to lead for all their members. Nursing education programs should integrate leadership theory, business practices across the curriculum, including clinical practice. And finally, public, private, and governmental healthcare decision makers at every level should include representation from nursing on boards, on executive management teams, and in other key leadership positions. To further advance our discussion about health policy, let's first distinguish between policy and politics. Policy can be defined as a set course of action or inaction undertaken by governments or healthcare organizations to obtain a desired health outcome. On the other hand, politics is defined by Kalish and Kalish with the following statement. Throughout our daily lives, politics determines who gets what, when, and how. Politics has been defined as the process of influencing the authoritative allocation of scarce resources. The authors of the book entitled Policy and Politics in Nursing and Healthcare discuss the who, where, what, when, and why of nurses being involved in policy. We have talked about some of these elements briefly, but let's look at them as outlined in this publication. Who should be involved to influence health and social policy? As outlined earlier, nurses should be. They are credible and trusted, and they have an obligation to their profession, some of the many reasons as to why they are the who. Where should nurses act to influence policy? Mason et al. would say that nurses should act in four different arenas, including the workplace, the government, associations, and or special interest groups, and within the community. What types of strategies should nurses use to influence policy? While there is quite a list of possibilities, we will list only a few here as they are talked about in more depth later in the presentation. What they include, building a coalition, serving on a board, writing letters to policy leaders, publishing articles, and the list goes on. When should nurses act to influence policy? There are often times that present themselves with great opportunities for nurses to act. These may include when a social or a health problem needs a remedy, when a focusing event occurs, when the political environment is ripe, when the national or local mood supports change, when the opportunity is identified, when a policy has unintended consequences. The last question to answer to the who, where, what, when, and whys of nurses, influencing policy is the why. To some, this may be obvious. To others, maybe they have not thought about it. Mason et al. lists these answers to the why part of the question. To improve health, to improve access to care, to improve the safety of care, to improve the quality of care, to remove disparities in care. Let's take a look at some past health policy initiatives that have been identified as examples for purposes of this module's education. While only scraping the sur surface of past legislative efforts, you can see that the areas of health policy impacted are many and varied. Some of them include those listed here, including critical access hospital regulations, full practice authority for nurse practitioners, community paramedics, telemedicine, Nurse Practice Act, Children's Health Insurance, Seat Belt Booster Seat Bill, Health Care Reform, Tobacco Legislation, Higher Education Funding, Public Health Funding Allocation. To impact health policy, one has to first be willing to enter the realm of practice, oftentimes one where nurses are scared to be. Many feel that being a nurse involves caring and compassion and may feel that politics and policy are not the softer side of nursing. That does not have to be the case. Nurses need to overcome that barrier and get involved. There are many ways to do so, including some of the examples listed here, such as getting involved in the Units Infection Control Committee, your committee health boards, a professional organization, or simply a visit to the city Council, state legislature to learn more to, or to promote and advocate for the cause. 
Health policy does not have to be all about politics, but often it, it is. So let's take a look at the political process. Having an understanding of the political process is important to feeling comfortable navigating the system and the process. While this module is not all about providing a government class, it is intended to provide the resources necessary to understand the process so you feel empowered to jump into the arena. Hi, my name is Kyle Martin and I am the Marketing Coordinator with the North Dakota Center for Nursing. I also previously worked as a legislative aide in the 60th North Dakota Legislative Assembly and also served as a federal intern in Washington, D.C. To provide a better context for our discussion, let's begin by asking ourselves a basic question. What is government? Merriam-Webster defines government as the group of people who control and make decisions for a country, state, etc. The form of government we have in the United States is a representative democracy. This means that rather than citizens voting on every single issue, they elect leaders to represent their interests in the policy-making process. The people that an elected official, such as a congressman, senator, or governor, represent are their constituents. One of the inherent risks of a representative democracy is that once an individual is elected to public office, nothing legally binds them to vote in a certain way. This means that candidates can make promises to voters on the campaign trail but then break those promises once they are elected. This is why it is so important that we as citizens stay engaged in the policy making process and hold our elected officials accountable. The structure of the United States federal government as established by the Constitution consists of the separation of powers. To ensure that no branch of government becomes too powerful, the functions of government are divided into three branches the legislative, the executive, and the judicial. This is often referred to as a system of checks and balances. The first branch of government that we will discuss is the legislative branch. This branch of government is tasked with the responsibility of passing laws. At the federal level, the legislative branch is generally referred to as Congress, while at the state level it is usually referred to simply as the state legislature or the legislative assembly. At both the state and federal level, the legislative branch is bicameral. This means that the branch is divided into two chambers, the House and the Senate. The Senate is the most prestigious of the two chambers. At the federal level, apportionment in terms of senators are conducted in accordance with the U.S. Constitution. Each state has two U.S. senators, regardless of their population. This means that in the Senate, the large state of California has the same representation as the much smaller state of North Dakota. Senators represent their entire state and are chosen through a statewide election. They are elected to serve terms of six years. Elections for the U.S. Senate are staggered, meaning that ter terms of the 100 American senators conclude in different stages. Every two years, one-third of the country's Senate seats are up for election. The U.S. Senate was designed to be the more deliberate, slower-moving Chamber of Congress. The U.S. House of Representatives is structured much differently than the U.S. Senate. In contrast with the Senate, where each state is represented by an equal amount of senators, seats in the U.S. House are allocated to each state proportionally based on population. The larger a state's population, the more House seats they are allocated. Regardless of the population, however, each state is guaranteed at least one seat in the U.S. House of Representatives. Reapportionment is done every 10 years. If the national census indicates that a state's population has grown or shrunk relative to other states, the number of House seats allocated to them may increase or de decrease. In states with just a single House seat, like North Dakota, representatives are elected by a statewide vote and they represent the entire state. Most states, however, have multiple seats in the U.S. House. The respective state legislature divide their state into a number of congressional districts. Each district is required to be approximately equal in population, based on how many seats they are allotted. These representatives are chosen through elections held within each district, not by a statewide vote. In Congress, they are tasked with representing the constituents of the particular district and not the entire state. 
Terms for House members are two years in length, much shorter than the six-year term served by U.S. Senators. Another contrast with the Senate is that all members of the House face election at the same time, meaning that elections are not staggered. This chamber was intended to be the People's House and was designed to be much faster moving than the U.S. Senate. In theory, it is supposed to be more reflective of the population's changing viewpoints, which is why its members face re-election more frequently than the members of the Senate. Originally, there was an even more clear distinction between the House and Senate. Members of the Senate were originally elected by each state legislature, not by a vote of the people. The structure of the North Dakota Legislative Assembly differs from the United States Congress and is outlined in the North Dakota Constitution. Members of both the North Dakota Senate and the North Dakota House of Representatives are elected to serve four-year terms. The state is divided into 47 legislative districts, all of which are approximately equal in population. Each legislative district is represented in the state capital of Bismarck by one state senator and two state representatives. Elections are staggered so that approximately half of the state's legislative districts hold elections every two years. The two chambers of the legislative branch, the Senate and the House, vote on laws separately. If a law passes one chamber, it is sent to the other for consideration. If a law is passed by both the Senate and the House, it is sent to the executive branch to be signed. At the federal level, the law is sent to the President of the United States. At the state level, it is sent to the Governor. A law cannot be sent to the executive branch to be signed unless it passes both chambers of the legislative branch. The executive branch is the branch of government that is tasked with executing the laws that are passed by the legislative branch. At the federal level, the executive branch is led by the president. At the state level, it is led by the governor. Both the president and the governor are elected to serve terms that are four years in length. At the federal level, the president and vice presidential candidates run together as a ticket. They are elected by a vote of the Electoral College, not by a popular majority rule style vote. Each state has a designated number of votes in the Electoral College that is equal to the sum of their number of U.S. Senators and Representatives. For example, the state of North Dakota, which has one representative and two Senators, has three votes in the Electoral College, the minimum a state may have. Minnesota, which has eight representatives and two senators, has ten votes in the Electoral College. If a presidential ticket wins the popular vote within a given state, they win the whole state of that state's electoral votes. As an example, if presidential candidate A wins 53% of the vote in Minnesota and presidential candidate B receives 47% of the vote, Presidential candidate A wins all 10 of Minnesota's electoral votes, while presidential candidate B receives zero. Right now, there are a total of 538 votes in the Electoral College. In order to be elected, a ticket must receive a simple majority of votes in the Electoral College, a total of 270 votes based on current figures. One of the biggest criticisms of the Electoral College is that it can allow for presidential ticket losing the popular vote to another ticket, yet still be elected. This happened when George W. Bush was elected in 2000 over Al Gore. Another point to take note of this is that states with smaller populations, like North Dakota, have greater influence in the electoral college system than they would if the president was selected through a nationwide popular vote. Each state is guaranteed three electoral votes based on the minimum congressional representation of one representative and two senators. A state with over the twice population of North Dakota, which has two seats in the House of Representatives, would have just one more vote in the electoral college than North Dakota. Another effect of the Electoral College is voters from certain states, referred to as swing states, receive more attention than others. If a candidate knows they are unlikely to receive the most votes in a given state, there is little incentive for them to campaign there at all. Democrats realize that they are probably not going to win the state of Texas, and Republicans realize they're probably not going to win the state of California. A Republican presidential candidate campaigning heavily in California could certainly increase their vote share, maybe even by a margin of several million votes but they would probably still receive fewer votes than the Democratic candidate. Because of the Electoral College, this increase in vote share would not improve the Republican candidate's prospects of being elected. 
It is because of this that the presidential campaigns target certain states very heavily and virtually ignore others. If presidential candidates were elected through a nationwide popular vote, Republicans would likely put more effort into courting voters from California, as would Democrats in Texas. Because even if they do not win in the state, they still benefit from earning some of the state's votes. Bringing it back to North Dakota, in our state, candidates for the positions of governor and lieutenant governor run together as a unified ticket and are elected to serve terms that are four years in length. In contrast to the use of the Electoral College at the federal level, a simple statewide election is used to determine North Dakota's governor and lieutenant governor. So we know the positions of president and governor both have a significant amount of power. But where exactly does this power come from? What exactly do they do? Even if laws are passed by the legislative branch, they do not go into approval without crossing through the executive branch. The president, or governor, has the power to sign into effect laws passed by the legislative branch. The executive also has the power to veto legislation that is sent to them. If this occurs, the law does not go into effect. Rather, it is sent back to the legislature for reconsideration. The legislature has the ability to override the executive's veto with a vote of a supermajority, a two-thirds vote of each legislative chamber. The legislature could also choose to modify the vetoed legislation, perhaps removing portions that the executive branch objected to, pass the modified legislation, and send it back to the executive branch. The veto may also kill the legislation. The vice president at the federal level and the lieutenant governor at the state level are also members of the executive branch. The vice president serves as the president of the U.S. Senate and the lieutenant governor serves as president of the North Dakota Senate. As a president of the respective chambers, the vice president and the lieutenant governor are a only able to cast a vote on legislation in the event of a tie. The executive branch includes more than just elected officials. All the various government departments charged with implementing and enforcing the laws and policies that are passed by the legislative branch are a part of the executive branch. A few examples at the federal level include the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the Department of the Treasury. Examples at the state level include the North Dakota Department of Health, the North Dakota Department of Transportation, and the North Dakota Department of Commerce. While these entities are not policy-making bodies per se, they do establish many rules and regulations. They are tasked with developing many of the procedures needed to enforce laws passed by the legislative branch. Leaders within these government bureaucracies are appointed by the executive branch. Finally, let's move to the third branch of government in the United States, the judicial branch. When most people think of this branch of government, they think of the court system or criminal trials. While criminal trials are a key component of the judicial system, Trying these sorts of cases is not their only function. The White House website provides valuable context in this area, stating, Federal courts enjoy the sole power to interpret the law, determine the constitutionality of the law, and apply it to individual cases. The court, like Congress, can compel in the production of evidence and testimony through the use of a subpoena. The inferior courts are constrained by the decisions of the Supreme Court. Once the Supreme Court interprets a law, Inferior courts must apply the Supreme Court's interpretation to the facts of a particular case. As can be gleaned from the White House description on the previous slide, it is clear that the judicial branch provides a crucial check on the legislative and executive branches of government. The judicial branch can strike down any law passed by Congress on the grounds of constitutionality and can also rule actions of the executive branch such as executive orders and actions of executive agencies to be unconstitutional. Still, this doesn't mean that the judicial branch does not have weaknesses. One of the weaknesses of the judicial branch is that courts cannot act alone. This means that if Congress passed a law which a federal judge recognized as blatantly unconstitutional, the judge cannot strike it down until somebody brings the case before them. Further, not anybody can challenge a law in court. It has to be somebody that has been wronged by the law. 
Perhaps the most significant weakness of the judicial branch is that courts have no enforcement mechanism. They may strike down a law on constitutional grounds, but they have no way of in enforcing their decision. The courts need the support of the executive branch in order for their decisions to be implemented and enforced. Without proper enforcement from the executive branch, decisions made by the courts may have minimal impact. For example, despite the Supreme Court striking down segregation in public schools in the Brown v. Board of Education decision, the practice of segregation in public schools continued in some regions for many more years. One of the most distinct differences between the judicial branch and the other two branches of the federal government is that judges and justices are appointed by the president, not elected by voters. Additionally, their appointments are for lifelong terms. Both of these factors help to insulate judges and justices from the outside world. Theoretically, because they do not have any voters to appease, they can make decisions based on their conscience, whether or not the decision is politically popular. In practice, Presidents are known to appoint judges and justices that are ideologically similar to themselves. As we've alluded through the module up until this point, government in the United States is divided at various levels. The national level of government is known as the federal government. Its components include the presidency, Congress, and the entire federal court system going all the way to the Supreme Court. Powers are both originated and limited by the United States Constitution. Perhaps the biggest limitation on the federal government's powers are found in the 10th Amendment, which states that powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. While the federal government has certainly grown in both size and scope since the founding of our country, these powers are not limitless. The next step is below is a state government. Most state governments have structured in a similar manner to the United States federal government. Instead of a president, there is a governor. Similar to Congress, just about every state has a bicameral legislative body, meaning it is divided into two chambers. Each state also has their own court system. The lower the level of government, the more the style and structures vary from one another. Take the following information with a grain of salt and use it as just a simple outline. City government is often referred to as municipal government. Most city governments have an executive branch led by the mayor. The legislative power of a city government lies in a city council. Many cities also have their own court system to hold individuals accountable to municipal ordinances. Countywide governing structures also exist. With that, you should have a good context for the rest of our discussion. You understand fundamentally what government is, and you know some of the basic terminology that is used in discussions related to government. But why does all this matter? Why is it important to be informed and engaged in the policy process? First off, whether or not you understand it, everything that the government does has some kind of effect on the public. It's also a part of our civic duty. Our system of government depends on participation from the public in order to function properly. We have a government by the people and for the people, but it still requires people to participate. If you don't stay informed and take advantage of your right to make a difference, then you are, in effect, surrendering your voice. Without your involvement in the process, laws will still be made. Will the, will the laws be made that are best for you or your family, organization, career, or any other area of personal interest? You don't know. Engagement in the involvement allows you to influence the outcome of the policy process. Laws can be created through a couple of primary routes. The first is by elected officials through the legislative process. The second way is through a formal vote of the people through referendums, initiatives, etc. The first option is much more common. How does this whole process work? Well, let's start out by examining a very brief overview of this process. First, a bill must be passed by the legislature, which is divided into two different chambers. Both chambers of the legislature must vote on the bill and pass it in order to move on to the next step. If one chamber is unable to secure the votes necessary for a piece of legislation previously passed by the other body, that legislation is essentially dead. 
Once both chambers have passed the legislation, it is sent to the governor's office to be signed and implemented. Without his signature, the bill does not become law. The governor may veto the law and send it back to the legislature unsigned. Even if the governor vetoes a bill by the legislature, the bill can still be made into the law if both chambers of the legislature vote with a two-thirds supermajority to override the governor's veto. The power to sign and veto legislation is among the most significant tools at the disposal of the governor. Because legislators want their legislation to be signed into law, they may be willing to make policy concessions to the governor to avoid a veto. Finally, the bill becomes a law and is implemented according to the text of the legislation. Some laws go into effect immediately at the moment they are signed by the governor. Others have a specified date in which they go into effect. Per the North Dakota Constitution, most bills that are passed by the Legislative Assembly go into effect on August 1st after being filed with the Secretary of State. That being said, there are routes that can allow a law to be implemented earlier, especially in cases of an emergency. Also, certain appropriation and tax measures become effective one month earlier on July 1st. The executive branch is charged with executing and implementing the laws passed by the legislature and signed by the governor. Various executive agencies may be assigned various responsibilities as necessary to implement and enforce the law. They may also develop additional procedures and regulations as needed to fill in the blanks of the legislation. Is it really this simple? Well, yes and no. This is how the system works on the surface, but there's a whole lot that goes on behind the scenes. Let's learn a little bit more about the legislature. At the federal level, the Senate is composed of 100 members, two from each state, and the House is composed of 435 voting members, plus an additional five non-voting members that represent the District of Columbia, the Virgin Islands, America Samoa, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. North Dakota's legislature is composed of a 47-member Senate and a 94-member House. Why is there a difference in size between the House and the Senate? As I'm sure you've noticed, at both the state and federal level, the House of Representatives is significantly larger than the Senate. This is intentional. The House was designed to be a chamber that was connected to the people most closely. By having more members, the viewpoint of more constituents will be represented. The larger number of members also means that there is a greater likelihood of a diverse range of ideas being considered in the policy making process. Another key difference at the federal level is that the House members face re-election every two years, while Senators only face re-election once every six years. This holds House members more accountable to the electorate than Senators. The Senate was designed to be more deliberative, slower-moving Chamber of Congress. It was envisioned as the more experienced Chamber. At the federal level, an individual must be a minimum of 30 years of age five years older than the minimum age of 25 needed to serve in the U.S. House. Because the chamber is smaller than the U.S. House, it should be easier for negotiations to take place and for consensus to form among the members. In today's highly polarized political environment, this may not necessarily be the case. Hi, I'm Senator George Sinner. And today I will be talking to you about campaigns, elections, and the legislative process. Now let's take a look at the political campaign process. It could be argued that the campaign election process is where the policy making process begins. Why do I say that? Because the candidates that are elected through this process are the ones that will be later be creating the policy. It's very important to have an understanding of this process. Let's start with a quick overview of political campaigns. To begin, I want to examine the two-party system. The American political process is characterized by some as a two-party system in reference to the two major political parties in the United States, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. You may be asking yourself the question, aren't there more than two political parties? If your answer is yes, you would be correct. In fact, there are dozens of political parties. Two of the more well-known third parties include the Libertarian Party and the Green Party. Further yet, some candidates run for office as independents without any sort of formal political label.
So if there are more than two parties and you don't even need to be a part of a political party to run for office, why do people say that we have a two-party system? Simply because it is hard to win unless you are a Republican or a Democrat. Advantages possessed by candidates belonging to either the Republican or Democratic parties can include the Electoral College. In order to win any votes in the Electoral College, a candidate has to win the popular vote in the state. In the 1990s, Ross Perot ran for president twice as a third-party candidate and gained a sizable amount of the vote, 18.9% in 1992 under the United We Stand Party and 8.4% under the Reform Party in 1996. Perot earned a sizable amount of the popular vote, but he didn't receive a majority of the popular vote in any state. This means he didn't earn a single electoral vote either year. Another advantage is that these parties have a much easier process to get on the ballot. Next, both political parties maintain a political infrastructure that makes it easier to fundraise, advertise, and persuade voters. Candidates have access to much of this infrastructure, thus giving a major advantage to the candidates running under either the Republican or Democratic label. When most people think of political elections, they think of the general election in November. The candidates that the voters in November get a chance to choose from are usually determined through a primary election held some time prior. The winners of the primary elections receive the nomination to be on the general election ballot. Per the North Dakota Century Code, these primary elections are held on the second Tuesday in June of every general election year. Primary elections generally have a turnout that is much lower than the general election. Primary systems differ from state to state, so we'll focus on North Dakota. The kind of primary system used in North Dakota is called an open primary. In an open primary, voters can only vote to nominate members of one political party on election day. There are not separate ballots for Republican and Democratic nominees, or members of other political parties for that matter, just different sections of the same ballot. This is an important point to emphasize. Voters in a primary election may choose to vote for either Republican or Democratic candidates once they are in the ballot box, but they cannot vote for both. This means that a voter who considers himself to be a Democrat could choose to vote for Republican candidates in the primary or vice versa, and vote for candidates they think their party's candidate would be able to defeat in the general election more easily. Most of the time in North Dakota, primary elections are a formality. That is, the majority of races are not contested by multiple candidates. There are multiple ways that a candidate can have their name placed on the ballot for the primary election. By far the most common way a candidate has their name placed on the election is through the party endorsement conventions. The Republican and Democratic parties in North Dakota conduct endorsement convention conventions at both the district and state level. Let's begin by looking at the district level. Conventions are held within each legislative district prior to the primary election in order to endorse candidates for the state legislature. This process can vary from district to district. Generally, parties endorse one Senate candidate and two House candidates. In order to vote on candidate endorsements, you must be a resident of the district. At the convention, candidates deliver speeches to attendees who then vote on their favorite candidates. The candidates that are selected at the district convention are the, then submitted for inclusion on the primary ballot. These conventions are very grassroots and easy to get involved with. Generally, there are relatively few people in attendance, so each person's vote can carry significant influence. Party endorsement conventions at the state level follow a similar model 
but at a much larger scale. Attendees at the state endorsing convention are known as delegates. Each district is represented at the state endorsing convention by their delegates. The number of delegates allotted to each district is determined by party rules and are not equal. Delegates for each district are elected to serve in the role at their district conventions. At the state party conventions, candidates are endorsed for partisan offices to be voted on statewide, including the U.S. Senate, the U.S. House, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Agriculture Commissioner, Attorney General, Public Service Commissioner, Secretary of State, State Auditor, Tax Commissioner, and Treasurer. Most of the time, the candidates selected at the endorsement conventions go into the primary uncontested, but sometimes they face challengers who have their name placed on the ballot through a different route. The alternative method available for candidates wanting to have their names placed on the ballot is through petitions. Candidates can have their name placed on the primary election ballot by circulating and submitting a petition signed by a sufficient number of qualified electors. The minimum number of signatures that is required varies by the circumstance. For legislative offices, the, sig the signature of at least 1% of the total resident population of the legislative district as determined by the most recent federal decennial census. The required number of signatures for other circumstances can be viewed by clicking on the link of this slide. The state of North Dakota is divided into 47 legislative districts, each represented in the North Dakota Legislative Assembly by one senator and two representatives. Every 10 years after the federal census takes place, the legislature goes through a redistricting process where the district lines are revaluated based on changes in the population. Each district is supposed to be roughly the same size in population in order to guarantee that each citizen is equally represented. Section 2 of the North Dakota Constitution states that the legislature shall guarantee as nearly as practicable that every elector is equal to every other elector in the state in the power to cast ballots for legislative candidates. The last time that redistricting happened in North Dakota was in 2011. At that time, each district was designed to include approximately 13,664 residents. The largest district after redistricting had 14,249 electors and the smallest district had 13,053. Now here is a map of North Dakota and its legislative districts. The North Dakota Legislative Assembly meets to conduct its regular session once every two years. The maximum length of these sessions is 80 days, per the requirements established in the North Dakota Constitution. These days do not need to be consecutive. The general session begins in January and ends sometime in late April. April or early May of odd-numbered years. In 2013, the Legislative Assembly convened on January 8th and adjourned on May 4th. Beyond the general session, the Governor has the power to call special sessions of the Legislature, which do not count toward the 80-day maximum. Modular interim co legislative committees may meet elsewhere in the state. 
These committees meet in between legislative sessions. Now we will begin to take a more comprehensive look at the North Dakota Legislative Assembly. First off, what does the legislature do exactly? What powers do they have? Simply put, the North Dakota Legislative Assembly passes the laws that govern the state of North Dakota. They set tax rates and appropriate funds for the operation of state government. An additional power vested within the Legislative Assembly is the power to advise and consent. This applies only to the Senate, not the House. As previously discussed, the Governor has the power to make appointments to a variety of positions within state government. Examples of appointments made by the Governor include members of the State Board of Higher Education, the Commissioner of Financial Institutions, and the Securities Commissioner. As a check on the power of the Executive Branch, the North Dakota State Senate has the power to advise and consent appointments made by the Governor. In essence, the State Senate has the power to either block or approve some of the appointments made by the Governor. Another power of the Legislative Assembly, perhaps better labeled as a responsibility of the Legislative Assembly, is that of oversight. It is the duty of the legislature to maintain proper oversight over executive agencies, government subdivisions, and other organizations that are receiving financial or other support from the legislature. The legislature has a duty to ensure that each of these groups are respecting the intent of the legislation that they enact. They must ensure that the taxpayer funds they have allocated are being spent appropriately. In order to have a strong understanding of the legislative process, it is pivotal to have a grasp of the terminology that is used. So what exactly is a bill? What is a resolution? The website of the North Dakota Legislature has a section which describes the terminology well, in addition to giving a strong overview of the process. Their website states, quote, Bills create, amend, and repeal laws. To become a law, a bill must pass the House of Representatives and the Senate by a majority vote of the members elect in each House. Bills may be introduced by members of the Legislative Assembly, Standing Committees, or Legislative Management. A state executive agency or the North Dakota Supreme Court can have bills automatically introduced in the name of the Standing Committee to which the bill will be referred. House bills begin with the number 1001 and Senate bills begin with the number 2001. The Constitution of the North Dakota, Article 4, Section 13, provides that bills adopted by the Legislative Assembly generally take effect August 1st after the filing date with the Secretary of State. However, certain appropriations and tax measures become effective July 1st. The effective date may be later if specifically written into a bill. The effective date may be earlier if the Legislative Assembly declares an, quote, emergency, unquote, and the measure receives a two-thirds vote of the members elect of each House, unquote. The site also describes a resolution as, resolutions propose constitutional amendments, express opinions, request actions, congratulate, or console. Resolutions do not have the effect of law. Resolutions are the vehicles used to propose constitutional amendments for voter consideration. Resolutions are used to request an interim study by the legislative management on a specific subject. Resolutions frequently express legislative opinion to Congress or other federal offices with regard to federal programs or policies. House concurrent resolutions begin with the number 3001 and Senate concurrent resolutions begin with the number 4001. Concurrent means that a particular resolution must be approved by both the House and Senate. 
the House or Senate may use resolutions for their own separate business, such as memorial resolutions for deceased members. For example, a House Memorial Resolution 7001 and Senate Memorial Resolution 8001. Another term to know is a session law. As the North Dakota Legislature's website states, session laws contain the text of all measures, enacted bills, or adopted resolutions by a particular legislative assembly. Session laws include constitutional amendments proposed by the legislative assembly. Vote totals are provided for those approved or disapproved since the publication of the preceding laws. Initiated members, initiated laws or constitutional amendments and referred bills submitted to the voters since publication of the preceding session laws. This includes the vote totals. Governor's veto messages. Lists of House and Senate members. A statewide legislative district map. Being an effective advocate may include building relationships with legislators that can support your cause. The best place to start may be right within your own district. So you may ask yourself, who are my legislators? Each district in North Dakota contains one seat in the Senate and two seats in the House of Representatives. This means that, except in relatively rare circumstances of a vacancy, Every North Dakotan is represented in the Legislative Assembly by a single state senator and two members of the House of Representatives. To find out who your legislators are, you must first know what legislative district you reside in. Your legislative district is determined based on your residency in the state. An individual's residency is determined by state law. Section 54-01-26 of the North Dakota Century Code, Residence Rules for Determining, lays out some basic rules, several of which we have included in this module. First, every person has in law a residence. In determining the place of residence, the following rules must be observed. It is a place where one remains when not called elsewhere for labor or other special or temporary place and to which the person returns to in seasons of repose. There can only be one residence. A residence cannot be lost until another is gained. The residence can be changed only by the union of act and intent. The North Dakota State Constitution also addresses the issue of residency. Article 2 of the North Dakota Constitution emphasizes that no elector shall lose his residency for voting eligibility solely by reason of his absence from the state. Section 16.01-14 of the North Dakota Century Code establishes that to be a qualified lector for a given precinct or district, an individual must have resided there for at least 30 days prior to the election. Essentially, if you have lived in the same location for more than 30 days, that location can be claimed as your residency. If you have not lived in a given location for 30 days, your previous address is still used to determine your residency. The biggest takeaway from all of this, you can establish residency by living in a location for 30 days. If you move away from that location, you do not forfeit your previous residency status until you reestablish yourself someplace else. On this slide is a map of the state divided by legislative districts. As you can see, some legislative districts are geographically much larger than others. Again, this is because the state is divided into legislative districts based on population, not geographic size. If you live in one of the larger districts, it may be easy for you to determine which district you reside in based on looking at this map. However, 
if you live in one of the state's larger cities or near the border of two districts, you may find it difficult. However, if you live in one of the state's larger cities or near the border of two districts, you may find it more difficult to tell which district you are a resident of. The state of North Dakota's website provides maps of smaller geographic areas for some of the state's larger communities, in addition to an interactive statewide map. If you live in an urban area, these options may be useful for you. Links to the various map can be accessed by following the link provided on the slide. Once you have determined your legislative district, you are just a few steps away from knowing who your legislators are. To begin, open up your internet browser and visit the website www.legis.nd.gov. A screenshot of the website is shown on this slide. On the left side of the page, click on the link referencing the current Legislative Assembly. You will then be brought to this page. As you can see on the right side of this page, under the heading Membership Information, click on the link which reads Members by District. You should now be viewing a page which lists all of the members of the current Legislative Assembly divided by their districts. Simply scroll down until you find your district and your legislators. To find out more about an individual legislator, to find out more about an individual legislator and to see their contact information, simply click on their name. As an example, here is a screenshot of the state webpage for Representative Thomas Beadle. This page shows his district, his political party, chamber, committee membership, contact information, and a brief. Knowing who your legislators are is an important step, but if you are interested in advocating for an issue, you need to reach out to them. Many people are intimidated about getting in touch with their legislature. Whether that, be given them, whether that be giving them a call or sending them an email, knowing that there isn't any reason to be. North Dakota has what is known as a citizen legislature. That means that, other than a period of 80 days every two years, your legislators live perfectly normal lives. Many have careers outside of politics, and odds are that their home isn't too far from your own. If the idea of talking to your legislator makes you nervous, if the very thought intimidates you, just think of it as speaking with a neighbor or coworker about an issue that matters to you. That's exactly what it is. Do not be surprised if it takes a little bit for your legislator to respond to your communication. Your legislators are busy people. Like we just discussed, in addition to their public service, many of them have full-time jobs and personal obligations. You have every right to expect that they should respond to you, but don't be surprised if it takes them a little while to do so. This is especially true if you are reaching out to them during the legislative session or close to an election. These are extraordinarily busy times for legislators where they are balancing a lot of duties and obligations. Responding to your feedback is certainly among their obligations, but be understanding if it takes a little while. These are times when they are probably receiving the most feedback from their constituents, which means they have a lot of people to respond to, and there are only so many hours in the day with which to do so. Now we will move into a discussion on leadership within the Legislative Assembly. 
Both chambers of the legislature have leaders that are not elected by the state's voters, but by the members of the legislature themselves. The party whose member compose a majority of a chamber is known as the majority party, while the party that has the fewer members is known as the minority party. The majority party elects majority leadership, and the minority party elects minority leadership. Leadership positions within the Senate include the President of the Senate, which is the state's lieutenant governor and is not elected by the Senate themselves. Other positions include the President pro tem, the Majority Leader, the Assistant Majority Leader, the Minority Leader, the Assistant Minority Leader, the Majority Caucus Leader, and the Minority Caucus Leader. The names of the leaders that served during the most recent legislative session are on this slide. As you can see on this slide, the House leadership structure is similar. Leadership positions in the House include the Speaker of the House, the Majority Leader, the Assistant Majority Leader, the Minority Leader, the Assistant Minority Leader, the Majority Caucus Leader, and the Minority Caucus Leader. Now that concludes our summary of the legislature. Next, we'll talk about the lawmaking process. Hello, my name is Representative Joshua Boucher from District 44 in North Fargo. Today, we'll be talking about the lawmaking process. After gaining an understanding of how the Legislative Assembly works, how a bill is passed, etc., you may be wondering where do all these bills come from. Some of them are very lengthy. Most are written in complex language. We know they don't write themselves. What happens before they're put up for a vote on the floor of the House or the Senate? Bills and resolutions can be written by legislators, interest groups, and even individuals interested in making an impact on the process. Note that while anybody can write a piece of legislation, it will require a sponsor to be considered in the legislative process. Why do individuals write legislation? What is the ultimate goal of all their effort? Prior to writing any legislation, a potential author should establish a clear purpose for their effort. Among many others, a few questions that potential authors may want to ask themselves include, what are my specific objectives? What is the overall goal that I want this legislation to accomplish? What are common themes of my objectives? Was anybody else trying to do this in North Dakota or in the region or in the country? Considering these questions and others prior to drafting legislation will help guide the author through their efforts and ultimately make them more successful. Another very important area to consider is partnerships. Odds are you, as an individual, or your group are probably not the only individuals that are interested in your cause. If you are able to identify other individuals or groups working to address the same issue as you are, you may be able to join your efforts to mutual benefit. Consider if there are any interest groups that may have a similar goal to yours. Are there any individual legislators that may be interested in promoting this issue? Does your issue align with the views of one of the major political parties? In addition to assisting in identifying potential partners for your cause, answering these questions will also help you recognize potential roadblocks or opposition you may encounter throughout the process. The process of writing law is complex. Authors want to make sure that the text of their legislation is consistent with their intent. They want to make sure that the bill accomplishes their goals while also avoiding unintended, undesired consequences. For this reason, it is very common for authors of legislation to seek legal counsel to assist them in the process of crafting legislation. This legal assistance helps to ensure that the bill includes the appropriate language to accomplish the author's objectives. One of the many factors that must be considered when drafting a bill is the status quo. Is the bill a new addition to law? Is the bill amending existing law? Or is the bill repealing existing law? How these questions are answered will help determine the proper style and language to use in drafting the legislation. No matter how hard an author works prior to having their legislation submitted for consideration, it is unlikely that the bill will pass without any sort of changes being made. Bills go through many changes from the time they are first introduced to the time they are signed into law by the governor. This means that if groups' ideal legislation is introduced, 
it probably will not look the same by the time it is passed, if it is passed at all. This means that there are some important considerations which authors of legislation need to take into account. First, what is the likelihood of the legislation getting passed? Do you expect the legislation to spark a lot of controversy? Another important area to consider is whether or not your legislation contains room for compromise while still making progress towards your group's objectives. You need to think about what elements of the bill are absolutely essential in order for you to accomplish your overall goal. Sometimes groups need to recognize that if they are serious about accomplishing their goal, it is best to approach the goal incrementally. Perhaps this means pushing pieces of legislation over a period of time spanning multiple legislative sessions. People tend to be resistant to change, and for that reason change is often very controversial. Generally, the more controversial a piece of proposed legislation is, the more difficult it will be to pass it. The larger the proposed change, the greater the challenge of passing it will be. This presents additional questions that group and individuals need to seriously consider when they are drafting their legislation. First, does the group realistically believe that they can have the legislation passed in its entirety? That is, do they think they can accomplish their goals in a single piece of legislation without taking an inc incremental approach? Also, is their effort worthwhile if they can get some of what they want but not all of it? Is this an all or nothing kind of issue? Authors must also consider what parts of their legislation they would feel comfortable dropping during their policy making process. In these considerations, they should ask themselves if there are elements of the legislation that will create unnecessary controversy. Remember that the more controversy the bill creates, the more difficult it will be to pass it. If there are controversial elements that are not entirely necessary to accomplish the objectives of the bill, it may be best to remove them before the bill is introduced. Another strategic question to ask is whether it would be in the author's interest to deliberately include content in the bill which can be dropped later. Should the author include content that goes above and beyond their goal? Some of the benefits of this strategy include the fact that if the legislation is able to make it through in its entirety, you are able to exceed your goal. Additionally, there is more room for compromise to be made during the policymaking process without sacrificing the objectives of the bill. However, there are drawbacks as well. This approach could create unnecessary controversy. Depending on the circumstances, this controversy could threaten the entire legislation, not just the extra parts. If it is too controversial, legislators may not even want to touch it. Now let's cover a few general questions you may have regar regarding the bill writing process. First, when do bills typically get written? Usually, bills are written prior to the start of the legislative session. The deadline for submitting bills to be considered happens relatively early during the legislative session, so it makes sense that these bills would be written prior. Next, what happens if multiple people submit similar bills? Sometimes, multiple legislators write bills that have similar content. They may have been designed to address the same problem or otherwise centered in the same idea. Differences between these pieces of legislation could be minor and differ in the style or language used. However, more significant difference between multiple Similar pieces of legislation could be in their magnitude. In this case, I'm using magnitude as how extreme an approach to legislation is taking to address the issue of consideration. A simple ex example of this is two bills allocating a different amount of funds to the same cause. If your group is drafting a piece of legislation, you will need to secure a sponsor in order for it to receive consideration by the Legislative Assembly. Multiple legislators can sponsor the same piece of legislation, and in these cases they are known as co-sponsors. After a legislator has become a sponsor, that bill or resolution is branded with their name. Finding the right sponsor for your legislation is absolutely critical. Choosing the right sponsor or sponsors can give your legislation a big boost, but selecting the wrong sponsor could threaten the viability of your bill or resolution. The first thing to consider in the selection process should be the pretty obvious. Which legislators will support this policy? Regardless of how respected or esteemed a legislator is, if their views sharply contrast your pr proposed legislation, they should probably be removed from your list of potential options. Another big factor on this point is partisanship. While Republican and Democratic legislators may be able to find compromise on some issues, 
On other issues, their ideas starkly contrast one another. If your legislation addresses a party line issue, it is important to identify the party you are more likely to receive the support of. Unfortunately, the politics of the political process can also make things difficult. This is particularly true in high partisan environments where political parties are often hesitant to grant their opposition political victories. For example, the majority party may attempt to block legislation that was proposed and pushed by members of the, of the minority party, even if they agree with it. If the legislation passes, it would strengthen the minority party at the expense of the majority party. If they really like the idea, members of the majority party can author legislation and propose it themselves, allowing their own par party to take credit. This process doesn't always make sense, but it's important that policy advocates acknowledge it. Sometimes, having the right sponsor can help to mitigate the threat that political division may pose to your legislation. Politicians love to campaign on their ability to reach across the aisle and work with politicians, but sometimes they may struggle to find opportunities to do so. Being able to secure sponsors from both the Republican and Democratic parties sends a very strong message to the public. Further, if both of the parties are able to share credit for legislation that they both agreed on, they do not need to be as afraid of the other party scoring political points. If it isn't possible to find sponsors from both sides of the aisle, or for whatever reason it would be impractical to do so, it may be most desirable to have a sponsor from the majority party. This is particularly true if the same political party controls both chambers of the legislature, and even more so if the governor is part of the same party. It would be misleading to say that members of the same party vote together 100% of the time, but as a general rule, most legislators of the same party vote together. Having a member of the majority party sponsor the legislation may make it easier to secure votes from their party. The committee membership of a potential sponsor is another important area to take into consideration. A legislator serving on the committee that will be considering the legislation may be respected on the subject matter. Their experience serving on the committee likely means that they are well informed and knowledgeable of the history applicable to the issue. This background may also enable them to be very valuable in helping you draft the legislation from the start. Further, these legislators will be in a strong position to defend the legislation during committee discussions. The life experience of a legislator also makes them uniquely qualified to sponsor your legislation. If their personal or professional background is related to the subject matter, they may be better prepared to make a strong case for it. This is especially true if they are viewed as an expert in the area. Additionally, a legislator that is personally affected by the problem the legislation was designed to combat may be a more passionate advocate. As an example, a legislator that spent their career working in the public school system as a teacher and was well respected in the field could be a strong voice for an education reform bill. Personal reputation of the legislator is another important factor to look into. A legislator that is not well respected by the public may not make for a good sponsor, even if they are a strong advocate for the legislation. The sponsor becomes the face of your legislation and you want it to be a positive face. You don't want the spirit of the, of the legislation to be tarnished by a legislator with a poor reputation. You want to make sure that if a legislator is going to vote against your bill, it isn't because of the person who is sponsoring it. Finally, you need to consider trust. Whenever possible, you want your sponsor to be a person that you trust to work towards accomplishing the goals of your legislation. Prior to asking a legislator to sponsor your bill, you want to be confident that their goals for the legislation are aligned with the goals of you or your organization. Moving on now to the topic of legislative committees. First, what's the point of committees? Simply put, the legislature handles a lot of issues in a limited period of time. So as we had mentioned previously, bills often go through many changes during the policymaking process. It's tough to work through a brand new piece of legislation in a body composed of dozens of members. Committees obviously have fewer members than the whole of the assembly and thus allow for more in-depth discussion. The committee process may also create more room for negotiation. Because the subject matter they handle is limited, there is much more time for intense deliberation. Members are able to express their concerns and elaborate on them. This affords proponents the opportunity to make the concessions that are necessary for them to garner more support and secure sufficient number of votes. Another reason that committees are so important is that it's difficult for legislators to be experts on every issue. 
The legislature is filled with many experienced individuals. Still, no matter how much work a legislator puts in, it's difficult to be an expert on every issue that the legislature discusses. Individuals serving on legislative committees are able to listen to testimony from people ranging from everyday citizens to national experts. It is through this testimony, research, and lengthy discussion that committee members are able to become particularly knowledgeable in the committee's subject matter. Committee members emerge from the committee's process better able to speak on a bill's merits and potential problems by the time it reaches the floor of the legislature. When it is being considered by the entire chamber, other members of the General Assembly can utilize the expertise of committee members to assist them in making their own decision. In particular, they can use the recommendation of the committee to guide them in, the, in their decision-making process. As you can see from the next few slides, there are many different legislative committees covering a wide range of subject matter. in a committee structure. Interim legislative committees are committees which meet in, in between the general legislative session. Their purpose is largely educational. Members of interim committees gain a great deal of knowledge on the subject matter related to their committee. They are given updates by individuals involved in programs that are supported by, or for some other reason, of interest to the legislature. Additionally, they hear testimony from individuals that are experts on the committee's subject matter. Interim committees also provide an opportunity for everyday individuals to give comments to members of the committee. This is a great opportunity for citizens to interact with their legislators and have their voices heard in between legislative sessions. The North Dakota Legislative Assembly's website provides a brief description. Between sessions, interim committees hold hearings, take testimony, and review information provided by the Legislative Council, state assemblies, and interested parties as they consider alternative approaches to issues raised by studies. So what do all of these committees actually do? Committees hold hearings, deliberate about proposed legislation, and make recommendations to their chamber. As you may be able to assume simply from the names of the committees, each committee handles a limited range of subject. How bills and resolutions are referred to a committee varies based on the chamber. In the House, the Speaker assigns proposed legislation to one of their various committees. In the Senate, the President of the Senate, the Lieutenant Governor, assigns legislation to the Senate's committees. Who serves on the legislative committees? How does this decision get made? The slots within each legislative committee are filled via appointments, and each legislator is appointed to serve on two standing committees with a few exceptions. Legislators that serve on the Appropriations Committee do not serve on any other standing committee, as this committee meets every day of the week during the general session. Leadership within the legislature, including the Speaker of the House and the majority and minority leadership, may also serve on fewer than two committees. Each chamber has its committee on committees that has the responsibility of appointing legislators to serve on various committees. Again, legislative committees hold public hearings and invite individuals to provide testimony on the issues at hand. Committee members engage in intense deliberation regarding the merits of proposed legislation, potential problems, and the overall impact that passing or declining the, to pass the legislation may have. During this process, as potential problems are recognized, potential amendments may be considered and made. At the end of this deliberation, the committees vote on a recommended course of action that they present to their chamber in the form of a report. Their committee reports are summarized in one of five ways. Do pass, do not pass, amend and do pass, amend and do not pass, and without recommendation. 
Because it is difficult for legislators to become experts on every bill under consideration, they often use these committee reports to help them make their voting decision. One significant difference between the North Dakota Legislative Assembly and Congress is that in the North Dakota State Legislature, bills cannot be killed in committee. Regardless of how the committee feels about a bill, all legislation that is considered by committees will be put to a vote on the floor of their respective chamber. However, while committees cannot formally kill bills, branding them with a do not pass recommendation certainly hurts their chances of passing a floor vote. The activities of the House and Senate are not perfectly coordinated. Their processes are different and they are composed of different members all of whom have unique political philosophies, experiences, and interests. This means that when both chambers try to tackle a given issue, the solutions they come up with may differ. Sometimes, both chambers of the legislature pass legislation that is similar, but not identical. Sometimes the intent is the exact same, and differences exist only in wording. In other cases, the two houses may pass legislation that virtually oppose one another. This is much more likely if different parties hold majorities in the two houses, such as if the Republicans control the House of Representatives and the Democrats hold a majority in the Senate. In order for legislation to be sent to the governor's office for his signature, it is essential that both chambers of the legislature pass bills which are identical to one another. In cases where both chambers of the legislature pass bills or resolution that are very similar, they will be discussed in a conference committee. The conference committee is composed of six members. Three of these members will come from the House, and three will come from the Senate. Those individuals appointed to the conference committees are tasked with merging common elements of the different pieces of legislation, which were previously passed by each of the two chambers, and reaching an agreement for the language to be used in sections of the, of the legislation that differ. When a bill emerges from the conference committee, it should not have any difficulty passing through the House and Senate for a final vote. During the legislative session, committees meet at a regularly scheduled time and place at the State Capitol building in Bismarck. The schedule for legislative committees can easily be found online during the legislative session. Interim committees meet in between legislative sessions. Their location may vary for each meeting depending on the committee. Another feature of the North Dakota State Legislature to be aware of is its legislative management. Originally established in 1945 as the Legislative Research Committee, Legislative management was originally composed of 17 legislators, including the majority and minority leader from the House and Senate, the Speaker of the House, six members of the Senate, four of whom were appointed by the majority leader and two by the minority leader, and six members of the House, four of them appointed by the majority leader and two appointed by the minority leader. At the end of each session, legislative management meets to determine what studies will be conducted during the interim session and which interim committees will be in charge of each study. Legislative management is also responsible for appointing legislators from both the House and Senate to serve on the various interim committees. Each legislator serves on at least one of these committees. Some interim committees are created by statute. Examples of these sort of interim committees are the Higher Education Funding Committee, the Employee Benefits Programs Committee, and the Legislative Ethics Committee. Beyond those created by statute, legislative management may create additional committees. Individuals and groups can have a tremendous impact on the legislative process by working within the committee structure. One powerful way that they can do this is by testifying to the committee. You probably have a lot of questions related to testifying. First, what does it even mean to testify? What's the purpose of it? How do you testify? What do you say? What do you do? What is the sort of information that legislators are actually looking for? Over the next few slides, we will read through a brief guide to testifying. Hello, my name is Mark Sanford. I'm a member of the North Dakota House of Representatives. Today I will be discussing how to testify and the strategy related to it. The following is provided by the North Dakota Legislative website on testifying. You have the right, as do all citizens, to testify before the North Dakota Legislative Assembly on any bill or resolution. North Dakota has one of the most open legislatures in the nation. Every bill must have a public hearing before a legislative committee, must be publicly voted upon by the committee, 
and then must be co come before the full House or Senate for still another public vote. Your opportunity to testify on a bill comes at the committee hearing. Legislative committees meet in rooms on the ground floor or in the legislative wing of the state capitol. You can come into a committee meeting at any time, even if the door is closed or a hearing is in progress. Lists of the legislative committees, committee members, and the days and places committees meet are available on this website and at legislative information kiosks in the hall between the Senate and the House chambers. Committee hearing schedules are available on this website and at the and the legislative information can be viewed on the monitors by the information kiosk and in the hall of the ground floor at the Capitol. Most current versions of bills and amendments are available on this website. You can also get copies of bills from the bill and journal room. However, if the bill has been amended, the printed bill may not include the amendments. Hearings before North Dakota legislative committees are generally informal and few rules need be observed. Before the hearing, you should find out when and where your bill will be heard. Be on time for the hearing. Usually, once a hearing is closed on a particular bill, no further testimony is heard. Plan your testimony. It is not necessary, but it is helpful to have written copies of your comments available. See if other persons will be testifying on your bill. If so, try to coordinate your testimony before the hearing to avoid duplication. Contact the Secretary of State's office if you are going to testify on behalf of anyone but yourself to see if you must register as a lobbyist. At the hearing, you should be present at the start of the hearing. All persons present usually get a chance to speak but sometimes, because of large turnouts, it is not possible to give everyone a chance to speak. If you do not get a chance to testify, your presence may be acknowledged, and you might be asked if you favor or oppose the bill. Also, you can always submit written testimony. At the hearing, you should always sign the witness sheet at the lectern. Give the bill number, whether you favor or oppose the bill, your name, your lobbyist registration number if you have one, and who you represent if other than yourself. Wait your turn. The chairman announces the beginning of the hearing on a particular bill. The clerk will read the bill. The first speaker is usually the bill sponsor. The chairman then asks for testimony first from proponents and then opponents. Plan on following the custom, although it is not absolutely necessary, of beginning your remarks by addressing the chairman and committee members, giving your name and address, and why you are there. For example, Mr. or Madam Chairman and members of the committee, my name is John Q. Public from Edmonton. I'm in favor of this bill because... Be brief. Do not repeat what others have said. The hearings are informal, so be conversational. Avoid being too technical. Avoid using acronyms or technical references unless you first explain what they mean. Do not be nervous or worried about doing something wrong. There are no rights and wrongs about testifying. Legislators are just your friends and neighbors who want to hear what you have to say. Expect some questions and comments from committee members. These questions are not designed to embarrass you, but merely to provide additional information. Avoid any clapping, cheering, booing, or other demonstrations. After the hearing, some committees vote right away after a hearing. Others wait until the end of the meeting. Some postpone voting until another meeting. All committee action is public, so you can stay to listen to committee debate and its vote, even though public comment portion of the hearing is over. One or two days later, you can check with the committee clerk, your legislator, or the legislative information kiosk to find out how the committee voted on your bill. 
Organizations that take the time to develop a comprehensive strategy for moving their legislation from the proposal stages all the way through to the governor's desk for signing are likely to be much more successful in accomplishing their goals. A lot happens between the time an organization decides that they would like to author a piece of legislation and the time that the legislation is signed into law. While it's impossible to fully account for every moving part in the policy-making process, organizations should have some sort of plan or strategy for each step of the process. Organizations can benefit by considering several areas when developing their strategy. Their volume, how open they are to compromise, their message, and who their carriers will be. When a group is pushing to have a piece of legislation passed, they need to decide what they want the volume of their message to be. Are they going through the steps of the policy-making process? Would it be beneficial for them to have a loud and public presence, or one which is quiet and behind the scenes? The Legislative Assembly handles a great deal of legislation, the vast majority of which the public never hears a word about. Why do you think this is? The reason is that the media is only able to share a limited amount of information. Newspapers only have a finite amount of space on their pages to share articles and a limited amount of journalists to write them. TV news stations only have a finite amount of time with which to cover a wide range of subjects. Because media outlets can only communicate a limited amount of information, they must make a determination of what is newsworthy. In making these determinations, they need to consider several questions. First, what stories are so critical to the interest of the public that the media outlet has an ethical obligation to share? Next, which stories will be of interest to the people? Finally, you need to remember that, ignoring just a few exceptions, media outlets are private, for-profit profit companies. This means that media outlets must also determine which stories will be beneficial to their ratings or readership, thus enabling them to make more profit off of sales and advertisements. Issues that media outlets determine to be newsworthy become a part of the news. Other items don't receive any attention from the news media and thus remain hidden from the public eye. Do you want your legislation to be newsworthy? Seatbelts. 
The law is enforced by police officers on patrol. But this enforcement mechanism has its flaws. It's impossible to catch most individuals violating the seatbelt law. It just isn't possible for officers to have their eyes on every automobile. Individuals are aware of this fact, and they know that if they choose not to wear their seatbelt, that there is just a small chance they'll be spotted by an officer and cited for the violation. Similar to other traffic violations, such as rolling through a stop sign in a residential community, citizens know that most of the time they will not be cited for violating the law. If the law isn't enforced well, how can you improve the likelihood of the legislation's purpose being accomplished? By making the legislation newsworthy, you can increase awareness of the underlying issue that the legislation is designed to address. Using the seatbelt law as an example, when the law was being discussed in the news, the public became more aware that the law was going to be passed and the penalties associated with violating it. The public also became familiarized with statistics related to the number of fatalities that could have been prevented had seat belts been in use. Additionally, the public was exposed to several particular tragedies that could have been prevented by the use of seat belts. Through this process, the public became more knowledgeable on the dangers and risks associated with the decision to not use a seat belt. This makes them more likely to change their behavior and work to accomplish the goal of enhanced safety that was the law's purpose, even if it is not the law itself making the difference. Another situation where a group may want to boost the media profile of their legislation is when they are attempting to strengthen the brand of their organization. Some groups may be trying to increase their credibility or enhance the public's knowledge of their group. Having a piece of legislation passed is a major accomplishment that could enhance the reputation of their group. In these situations, groups may find it advantageous to make their proposed legislation newsworthy. There are situations where a group may wish to avoid making their legislation newsworthy. One of these situations is when the bill is making minor changes to existing legislation. Sometimes the problems of a piece of legislation are revealed only after it's been passed and its implementation has begun. In these situations, changes will need to be made at a later date. Legislation which changes aspects of existing policy that relate to basic procedural or implementation issues may be able to garner a sufficient level of support from legislators relatively easily. This is especially true of the legislator sponsoring the legislation he is able to keep the legislature's focus on the procedural or implementation issues and not the question of whether or not the previously passed legislation should exist. Making this type of legislation newsworthy may threaten the likelihood of the legislation being passed. Since this legislation is designed just to address minor issues with the original policy, you may want to avoid rehashing the issue of the original policy, especially if it was controversial to begin with. If your legislation is determined to be newsworthy and receives a significant amount of media attention, all of the controversy associated with the original policy is likely to be brought back and dominate the discussion related to your legislation. This scenario is even more likely if opposing politicians view it as a way to score more easy political points against their opponents. Obamacare in Congress is a great example of this. A related situation is when the purpose of your legislation could be easily spun by political opposition interested in scoring a political victory. In this situation, a quieter approach may be preferred to avoid the threat posed by political gamesmanship. This is especially true if you are confident that you already have the support of the legislators you need to pass the legislation. Individuals and groups trying to push legislation through the legislature should be prepared to give on portions of your bill, especially if it is controversial. If your bill contains more room for compromise, you may find that it's easier to garner the support of legislators looking for give and take in the policy-making process. 
However, note that if your bill has too much room for compromise, it may be viewed from the start as too extreme and politically toxic, resulting in it not being given the basic consideration you're hoping for. This is a fine line to walk when proposing legislation, so it's very important to give the compromise aspect of your legislation sufficient thought before moving forward. Remember to think about whether or not accomplishing some of your goal is better than accomplishing none of it. There are some situations where groups may determine that it isn't worth their effort unless they can accomplish all of their goals. However, in other situations, an incremental approach where groups make some progress on their goals without entirely fulfilling them may still be beneficial and increase the probability of passing your legislation. This must be factored into your thought process when drafting legislation. Another component of your strategy to consider is your message. That is, what kind of public dialogue are you hoping to encourage related to your legislation? What are the key issues that you want the public to be aware of and discussing? Once you've answered these questions, a simple way for you to develop your basic message is to create an elevator pitch for your legislation, similar to that which may be developed by an entrepreneur launching a new business. The premise of an elevator pitch is simple. If you meet somebody in an elevator that asks you about your legislation, you might have about 30 seconds to describe it to them. So what would you say in those 30 seconds? What are the most important elements of your legislation? What is the goal of your legislation? What do you want the individual to take away from your 30-second conversation with them? Your legislation should be written in a manner that is consistent with this message you are trying to send to the public. Prior to the legislation being introduced, your group should develop talking points which are consistent with your legislation. Why is this an important process for your group to go through? Remember this. If your group is not setting the tone for the public dialogue on your legislation, somebody else will. You don't know who this will be, so if you don't frame the message, it could be your opposition that does. Because the way that your message is framed can have a significant impact on the outcome of your efforts, this needs to be a priority for your group. The final component of your overall strategy that we will discuss is your carrier. Who do you want to be the carrier of your message? Options can include legislators, interest groups, concerned citizens, and lobbyists. What is the difference between these options? First, you need to ask yourself who are the individuals that are in the strongest position to make the case for your legislation? Consider whether or not the issue is political in a way that would position a political party and the legislators who belong to that party to present the legislation. Are you aware of any interest groups beyond your group that are well known to the public and therefore would make strong partners in your efforts? Have you identified any citizens whose personal background, that is their personal story, would make them a strong advocate for your legislation? If so, it may be very important for you to court these individuals and ask for their help in carrying your message. You should also consider if your organization has previously worked with or knows any lobbyists whose professional experience and political networks will enable them to be a particularly effective carrier of your message. The process of choosing the individuals and groups that will carry your legislation's message is absolutely critical to your efforts. These people will become the face of your legislation. They will be the ones that are speaking with the media and sharing your message with the public. They will truly be the face of your legislation. You want to ensure that the face of your legislation is consistent with the spirit of the bill or resolution. The face of your legislation should be a person that will be received favorably by the public and enhance the likelihood of your efforts being successful. Hi, my name is Gina Kuava, and I am a public health nurse with Pemina County Public Health. 
On this section of the module, I will be providing you with a brief summary on advocacy. Let's discuss a very important component of this module, advocacy. How can a normal citizen influence the policy-making process? How can they help to gain the support of the public? How can they have an influence on legislators? Examples of techniques which can be used to impact the process include emails and letters to policymakers, meeting with legislators, petitions, and letters to the editor of news publications. Before starting the next slides on advocacy, please note that some healthcare agencies have guidelines or rules about employees and the role that they can have in lobbying. Please be aware of the policies in your place of employment to determine to what extent you can be involved as a representative of the agency versus a private citizen. The first advocacy technique we will discuss is emails and letters to policymakers. Interest groups have for a long time used letter writing campaigns to exert pressure on elected officials. How does this technique work? Interest groups have certain goals that they are trying to accomplish. These groups have lists of members and other individuals whose goals may align with those of the group. When an opportunity for the group to advance its goals presents itself, such as when a piece of legislation related to the group's goals are under consideration by the Legislative Assembly, the interest group may take steps to mobilize its members by organizing a letter-writing campaign. How does a letter-writing campaign work? Interest groups may begin by notifying their members and supporters of the issue at hand and why it is relevant, why it matters to them. Next, they ask these individuals to contact their elected official and urge them to take a certain stance on the issue. One strategy that interest groups use when organizing a letter writing campaign is to provide their supporters with a pre-written letter, essentially a template that only needs the individual's signature. This approach is less genuine than personalized letters being sent in. Elected officials, or more likely their staff, may be less swayed by a flurry of identical, professionally written letters than they would be by letters that are personally written. However, providing supporters with pre-written letters could result in a much larger volume of letters being submitted than otherwise would be, but the value of each of these letters will be less than if they were personally written letters. Obviously, the other strategy that groups can pursue is to encourage their supporters to submit personally written letters to policymakers. While these letters are much more genuine than templates, they are significant disadvantage of this approach as well. First, it takes a lot more time to draft a letter than to merely write your signature on one. This means that the volume of personally written letters submitted will probably be much smaller than if pre-written letters are provided. Further, the experience of an organization's communication staff means that they are probably able to compose a stronger letter than the typical citizen. These individuals will know exactly what they should include in the letter, including applicable facts, history of the issue, and other relevant content. These individuals will also know how to style the letter in the most effective manner. All of these factors need to be considered by an interest group pursuing a letter writing campaign. If an organization makes the choice to not provide supporters with pre-written letters, they should take steps to mitigate the disadvantages inherent with this approach. Options can include providing supporters with a list of key talking points, including basic arguments along with any particularly compelling data. They should also include the name and contact information for the, one, for the Office of the Supporters elected officials. Another option includes providing an example of a letter used for another issue so that the supporter has something to go off of when drafting their own letter. This will aid them in developing the style of their own letter. Perhaps the most basic thing they should include is the necessary supplies for sending in a letter, such as a stamp and an envelope. While this may be costly, it is a simple option that could have a significant impact on the volume of letters 
which are ultimately submitted. Modern technology has made it so that a letter writing campaign does not necessarily even require submitting physical letters. Now, citizens can utilize emails to contact their elected officials in a manner similar to letters, but much more quickly and efficiently. Email also makes it much easier for groups to mobilize their supporters. In an instant, a group can contact tens of thousands of their supporters via email rather than contacting them via phone calls or traditional mail, which is more, much more expensive and time-consuming. Interest groups can also utilize social media to create a buzz around a topic of interest and spread their message beyond their group of supporters. Groups can post a graphic with information related to their cause that their supporters will see, like and share, thus spreading the group's message beyond their core supporters. Individuals can post on politicians' Facebook pages or tweet at them, urging to take specific action on a cause. If the group is able to make their message go viral on social media, it may attract the attention of policymakers. Another approach to advocacy that is similar to a group launching a letter writing campaign is initiating a phone call campaign. This method of advocacy can be used by interest groups either independently or in conjunction with advocacy efforts. Groups contact their members and supporters and urge them to make phone calls to the offices of their elected officials and communicate a certain message. These supporters may be provided with basic scripts, talking points, and the phone numbers of their elected officials. This method may be more difficult for elected officials, and particularly their staff, to ignore. A barrage of letters and emails can be ignored by office staff, but it's harder to ignore persistent phone ringing and messages being personally communicated by constituents. Some supporters may see this as a quicker opportunity to advocate for an issue than drafting a letter is. They don't need to take the time to sit down, write up a letter, check for typos, etc. They just need to pick up their phone and dial a number that has already been provided to them. However, other supporters may be much more intimidated by the idea and prefer to send a letter rather than to speak to a staff member directly. This is perfectly okay and emphasizes why it may be beneficial for a group to inform their supporters of all the advocacy options available. On this slide, we'll discuss what you should include in an advocacy letter that is being written to an elected official. While we're specifically talking about a letter, know that the key points can be applied to other methods of advocacy, like emails and phone calls as well. First thing you need to include is a brief description or overview of the issue you are concerned about. It may also be beneficial to provide some historical context for the issue. The letter should include an explanation of why this issue represents a problem and should explain to the elected official specifically why this issue is relevant, relevant to them and why they need to be concerned about it. Beyond just bringing attention to the problem, the author should inform the elected official of exactly what you want them to do. What is the ideal outcome of this letter being sent? You need to address the question of why you are sending the letter to them. Is it for them to take a certain stance on an upcoming vote? Are you asking for them to introduce new legislation? Lay out what you envision to be the solution to the problem you are writing about and explain the role that you would like to see the elected official play in making that solution a reality. A few additional comments that should be remembered. First, be respectful and courteous in your communications. Even if you disagree with the policymaker on an issue or are upset with them for previous actions, respect needs to be maintained. Behaving in any other manner probably won't accomplish much beyond diminishing your credibility and damaging your capability to influence them. Next, you want to make sure that you are using professional language in your letter. Make sure that you have proper grammar in your letter and all words are spelled correctly. Failure to do this may diminish your credibility. Also, make sure to include your name, title if it is applicable to the letter, 
and contact information so that the elected official's office is able to respond to you. The next advocacy technique we will discuss is meeting with your legislator. North Dakota is very fortunate in this aspect. Elected officials in North Dakota are more accessible than most states because of our relatively small population and the part-time structure of our legislature. Potentially the most effective way that you can get your message across is through a physical face-to-face -face meeting with your legislator and North Dakotans have more opportunities to do this than citizens of most other states. Why is this method so effective? Well, simply, you can communicate a lot of information in a 30-minute meeting, probably much more than in a one- or two-page letter. Also, any questions that your legislator might have can be answered by you right away. Taking the time to set up a meeting with your legislators shows them that you truly care about the issue. They realize that if an issue is important to their constituents, the least they should do is look into it. So how do you set up a meeting with your elected official? The best way to do this is probably to call or email them or members of their staff. You should introduce any topics to them that you are interested in discussing. It may also be in your interest to provide them with context for the discussion in advance, perhaps a fact sheet or a white paper for your issue. In explaining to them why you would like to meet, you should also propose possible times Remember that during the legislative session, your legislator has a busy schedule. Meeting with the constituents should be an important component of that schedule, but it isn't the only one, and you may have to be flexible on time if you are serious about meeting with them. If you are hoping to meet with them during the legislative session, you should also remember that they will be spending most of their time in Bismarck, so this may be where you will have to meet with them. Outside of the legislative sessions, remember that your legislator may also have a full-time job and many other obligations, so be understanding if they aren't able to meet with you right away. When you go to meet with your legislator or elected official, try and dress professionally as this will boost your credibility. Bring printouts with any information that you want your legislator to take away from the meeting or any materials that will help guide the discussion. This may include key figures, graphs, charts, historical context of the issue, etc. Prior to meeting with them, you should also plan out the points that you would like to discuss. Because you will probably have a limited time to meet with them, you want to make sure that the most important issues are discussed early on in the meeting in case you don't have time to cover everything. This will maximize the value of the meeting for both you and the legislator. Petitions can be another great tool to support you in your advocacy efforts. They can be used to capture the opinions of citizens in a very tangible form. Here's how it works. Organizers draft a petition explaining the issue of concern, the problem and a proposed course of action, the solution, that signers of the petition are expressing support for. Next, organizers should set a goal for how many signatures they would like to collect. The collection of signatures can take place through a variety of methods. Examples may include tabling at high traffic areas, such as on college campuses, having a booth at the state fair, or having volunteers walking around the tailgating area before a sporting event. Some groups even hire private firms to collect signatures for them. Petitions can also be circulated online, and this has been a very popular method utilized by groups since the birth of the Internet. Even the White House has an online platform for citizens to create petitions and collect signatures. If a petition reaches an estimated number of signatures, the White House says that they will issue a response. Many free websites exist that provide citizens with a platform with which to circulate online petitions. Examples include the websites iPetitions and Change.org. Online petitions may be easier to organize than print petitions. First off, it is much easier to reach a large population virtually than in person. 
an email being sent to an organization's list of supporters or a link shared on a group's Facebook page or from their Twitter account could amount in the petition receiving a large amount of signatures more quickly than if the petition was circulated in person. Once the group has reached their signature goal or they have reached the end of the timeline they have established, they can present the petition to the applicable policy makers. In an attempt to obtain free publicity for their cause, groups can also share their petition with media outlets to boost public awareness. This is an important aspect of the petition process. These types of petitions are not just about collecting signatures. They are also about giving groups an opportunity to talk with citizens about a certain issue and bringing attention to that issue. Another strong tool to advocate for an issue in the public sphere is through letters to the editor. Flip through your local newspaper until you reach the opinion section and you're sure to find several letters to the editor covering a variety of topics. Usually these letters have something to do with some sort of political issue, often something that is timely and may have been covered in the paper recently. Other letters may come in response to another letter to the editor that had been previously pub published. Letters to the editor, LTEs, are a medium that everyday citizens can utilize to have their voice heard. While letters to the editor certainly have the appearance of being personal expressions, Many people do not realize that plenty of the LTEs appearing on the opinion page of your newspaper may not have been written by the person whose name appears at the bottom. Political parties, candidates, interest groups, and others realize that their cause will benefit if they are able to influence the public dialogue in their favor. To help shape the public's conversation, these groups strive to fill the opinion pages with as much content that is favorable to their cause as possible. Oftentimes, staff members for these groups will spend the time necessary to draft multiple letters to the editor in various styles and including different content. Rather than submitting these letters personally, though, they find other supporters to sign the letter and have them submit it to the newspaper in their name. Why is this beneficial to the group? It's beneficial because they can control the content which appears in the letter. They know that the content included in the letter is favorable to their cause and hope it will shape the public's conversation in their favor. Further, the message comes through a medium that appears to be grassroots. The public knows that Citizens for Policy Y will support Policy Y. So person A explaining their support for policy Y to be more persuasive. Letters to the editor are rather short and force authors to be concise in their message. Most newspapers set a rough limit for submission somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 words. Authors may begin the letter with a basic salutation. If you are referencing an article or a letter that ran in the previous issue, be sure to cite it here. Title of article, page number, and date. You need to grasp the reader's attention at the beginning of your letter. If a reader is trying to flip through the entire newspaper in their five minute breakfast before leaving for work, they scan or entirely skip most articles. You need to capture the reader's attention so that they will read your entire letter. Next, describe what the subject of the letter is and why it's important, why the reader should care about it too. Provide any necessary background content that helps to answer the following questions. What topic are you writing this letter in regard to? Why is this topic relevant now as opposed to last month? Has something happened recently that the reader needs to be made aware of? What kind of information do you have to share on the subject? If you're writing a letter to persuade readers, you may need to do more than just inform them. You need to take a stance on the issue at hand. You are writing in hopes of influencing the way that readers look at a certain issue. But before you can do that, you need to tell the reader how you feel about the issue. If you are writing to praise or express support for someone or something, do it. 
if you are writing to criticize or express opposition to someone or something, do it. But always remember that whenever you express an opinion, you need to explain why your stance is justified. Finally, you should propose a solution. If you aren't satisfied with the status quo, then what do you think should be done to improve it? When drafting your letter, remember that if you have professional or general life experience which lends you particular credibility on the issue you are writing about, be sure to mention it. This will enhance your credibility with the reader and improve your ability to share your message with the reader. Also, be sure to add a title to your letter. If you don't add one, staff of the newspaper will create one for you. The more control you can have over your own piece, the more it can align with your goals. To emphasize a previous point, remember that letters to the editor are short. If you go beyond the newspaper's word limit, they still may run the piece in its entirety at their discretion. However, it's also quite likely that they will take one or two other routes neither of which are particularly favorable. First, they may choose to not run your piece at all. Obviously, this is a bad. Second, they may still run your piece but cut parts of it to make it fit within the paper's word limit. They probably won't spend time identifying the best place in your piece to make cuts, so this process could damage your piece. These cuts may be minimally damaging and simply disrupt the flow of your piece or it could be critically damaging by removing essential information or a key part of your argument. Obviously, neither of these options are ideal and you should take steps to avoid them. The simple takeaway, stay within your word limit. It should also be emphasized that you need to have your name attached to the letter to the editor. Most newspapers will not run anonymous letters to the editor in order to promote the spirit of public debate. If you are going to be provided a platform from which to make your arguments or attacks, you need to associate your name with them. The easiest way to submit a letter to the editor is online, though you can also physically mail in the letter to the editor. Mailing address, applicable email address, or a page for online submission can be easily found on the website of most newspapers or on their opinion page. You may also be wondering when you send in letters to the editor. Know that if a newspaper decides to run a letter, it will usually appear in the paper within a few days of your submission. This means that you should send in your letter while the issue you are writing about is still relevant and that if it is in regard to an article recently run by the newspaper, it should be submitted within just a couple of days. In the advocacy section of the module, we covered several of the many tools which people from high-powered interest groups to, to everyday citizens can use to ad advocate for a cause, influence the policy-making process, and shape public dialogue. The methods we covered were email, letter-writing campaigns, meeting with your legislator, petitions, and letters to the editor. Remember that these are not the only ways that an individual or group can advocate for a cause that is important to them. Many other methods of communicating your message and influencing the policy-making process exist. If these methods are the right ones for your cause, great. If not, look for others. You need to find the methods that work for your organization and take advantage of them. Hi, this is Karma Hansen again. We've covered a lot of material throughout this module, ranging from the broad structure of government to the intricacies of the policymaking process. Now it's time to bring everything back into focus and discuss how you can apply what you have learned in your everyday life. Not every leader in the nursing community is going to be engaged in the legislative process, and that's okay. The legislature isn't only group that is tasked with developing the policies that have an impact on our lives. Other examples can range from getting involved on your local school board to working on a community foundation. Working through these organizations may allow a leader to make a significant impact on their community. So how does this kind of involvement link to other content that has been covered throughout this presentation? 
Simply put, if you have an understanding of how you can make an impact in the legislative process, then you can also make an impact in other areas of policymaking. All of the tools and processes that have been covered can also be applied outside of the legislative process. The topics we've covered were discussed primarily within the context of the legislative process, but ultimately they were about identifying problems, crafting solutions, marketing, gathering support, and advocating for a cause. There are lessons that can be applied in almost any field. As individuals, nurses have the potential to be incredibly influential. Working together, groups of nurses have the potential to be even more influential. Nursing is the most trusted industry in the country, and with that trust comes an ability to influence others. If there is an issue that you care about, you have a unique ability to help others understand why they should care about it as well. Now, ask yourself the question, how do I get involved? What can I do to make a difference? Think about what issues you are particularly passionate about. What are your interests? And what are those issues that you could talk about for hours? Next, who are the players in this area? What sort of groups or government organizations are doing work on these issues already? If your issue is increasing lighting in residential communities, maybe there is a city council subcommittee studying this right now. If your passion is assisting those that are in poverty, which nonprofit organizations could benefit from your involvement? The simple takeaway from this segment is that no matter what your issue is, there is probably another group that cares about the issue too. These groups can benefit from your involvement, and this involvement can enable you to make a difference in an area that you care about. If you're nervous about getting involved with the group, don't be. Organizations, particularly local groups, are always looking for members and volunteers. If you know somebody in an organization or community that you are interested in becoming a part of, have a discussion with them about how you can get involved. Is it as simple as starting to attend meetings? Do you need to pay membership fees? What is the time commitment like? Figure out the answers to these questions, and if the group still has something that you're interested in, take the necessary steps by joining. Don't be deterred if you don't know anybody in these organizations. Take the time to ask around and find if you have a friend that knows anybody in the organization. If you don't find success through these efforts, just take a look on their website, find a contact person, and give them a call. Again, don't be intimidated. The person at the other end of the phone call will probably be excited to hear from somebody interested in getting involved. And now, as we near the conclusion of the module, I want to review the three learning objectives that were discussed at the beginning of the presentation. They were, why should nurses be engaged or involved in the policy process? How can nurses influence the process? And how can nurses make sure that their voices are heard? I hope that everything we have covered so far has enabled you to answer these questions better than you had been able to do so before. Let's review each of these independently. First, why should nurses be informed or engaged in the policymaking process? There are issues that you care about and you can make an impact on these issues by getting involved in the process. Nursing is the most trusted profession and with that trust comes an obligation to bring attention to important issues of concern to the general public. If you aren't being engaged in policymaking process, there will be others who will be. There will always be individuals working to promote change, but you don't know what side of the issues these individuals will be working on. It could be the opposite of your own stance. One of my favorite quotes that applies to this point very well is by Plato when he states that, quote, The punishment wise men suffer from indifference to public affairs is to be ruled by unwise men, unquote. Remember that if you aren't taking steps to be involved in the policymaking process, your voice is not being heard, but the voice of others still is. The voice may be that of your opposition. To the second learning objective, how can nurses influence the process? The first step by raising awareness to important issues. Talk with your friends, your family, and your peers about the issues that are important to you. 
share news story on social media, and write letters to the editor about things that you care about. Do whatever you can do to make your message included in the public dialogue. The next area that you can influence the process by is getting involved. Join organizations. Volunteer to serve on boards or organizations you care about. Get active with your PTA or your neighborhood association. Just do something. Any sort of involvement is a step towards making a difference. When relevant issues come up, write letters, send emails, or make calls to your legislators or other elected officials. Meet with and lobby with them on issues that are important to you. Explain why you care about the issue and why they should too. Perhaps the most basic thing that you need to do is vote. It's an easy thing to do, yet it is such an important part of your obligation as a citizen. Finally, how can nurses make sure that their voices are heard? Know that if you can speak, your voice is going to be heard. Remember all of the different ways you can communicate your message that we discussed. Letters and emails, phone calls, social media, letters to the editor, and newsletters. These aren't all the options either. If you want to hear your voice heard, the first thing you need to do is start speaking. Also, remember that two voices are louder than one, and four voices are even louder than two. The more people you can get involved, the louder your message will be. Your friends and family probably have values that are very similar to your own. That means they'll likely care about the same issues that you care about. Share information with them and get them engaged as well. And with that, we will conclude this educational module. By applying the information you have learned over the last couple of hours, you will be able to influence the policy-making process, ensure that your voice is heard, and make a difference. It is my hope that you do just that. To earn your Certificate of Achievement for this module, please review the requirements in the following slides. On behalf of the North Dakota Center for Nursing, thank you for viewing this module on health policy.